Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, The Very Lost Particle Classroom Series, Series 6 on Method Development. My name is Julie Chen Nguyen and I'm going to be facilitating today. So it is my great pleasure today to introduce you our speaker, Dr. Jeff Bodicum. Jeff is our product line manager for particle characterization. He received his PhD in material science and engineering from Rutgers University and has years, years of experience focusing on, <laughs> it just means a lot when I say years, years, <laughs> focusing on dynamic light scattering, laser diffraction, image analysis, and really just tackling a bunch of a variety of different applications out in the field. He's especially interested in source of errors and measurement, scattering techniques, and microscopy. Okay, Jeff, your turn. Okay, well, I guess thanks for the introduction. Like Julie said, this is Jeff Bodycomb, and I'm gonna to talk today about method development, primarily talking around laser diffraction and particle size determination. And this is the uh, final webinar in a, in a classroom series we put together over this year. Okay, so quick overview. Talk a little bit about goals for building methods, then talk about choosing your measurement approach. You lock down your refractive index. You vary measurement settings that can influence the result and you know which could be measurement duration or sample selection. And then you'll test the method to see if it's reproducible and if it works well. So we'll kind of walk through each of those things. So kind of the goal of method development is really a reproducible method that tracks product performance. And really that's probably the top line goal is, is does it track how your product performs? Because I'm probably the only guy in the world who only cares about particle size, but most people track particle size because they want to see how the material will flow, how drugs release, how it compacts in tablets, and so on. You might have some other goals. Uh, accuracy, tricky subject, is it the real particle size? That's generally a question of definition. Uh, repeatability. Can you get the same answer twice off the same exact sample? Reproducibility. Can you get the same answer twice when you take two samples off the same batch? Resolution. Can you see changes that are important to you? And you might also want to match historic data with something that's faster and easier. You'll want to use a structured approach. And I list that as a goal because if you develop a method and you and three years later, questions come up, you want to be able to go find that dusty notebook and tell people exactly why you picked what you picked. Uh, you may even want to remind yourself your logic. It also gives you data to support selections that you made, and you want to document the process so your colleagues and yourself understand your choices. And the other advantage of documenting the process is if your particles change just a little bit, you can go back and look at your experiments and kind of make some intelligent guesses about how to update your methods. Uh, so it really is handy to kind of remember what happened. So uh, let me comment first on accuracy versus precision. And uh, this is kind of a classic illustration where if you're throwing darts and you have your darts spread out and far away from the, from the bullseye, you say, well, that's low accuracy, low precision measurements. You know, the nice thing about it is that they tend to be very inexpensive measurements and maybe that's all you need. You could have a very accurate measurement with a big spread. So that's a high accuracy, low precision. So your darts are spread out around the bullseye which is a little bit better because you say, okay, I have the answer I want. Then if you have low accuracy, that is you're missing the bullseye in high precision, tightly grouped results, that's usually a pretty happy situation. Uh, generally, I've found that once I get a measurement into the higher precision state, getting accuracy come, falls out pretty quickly or becomes quite easy. And finally, high accuracy, high precision is kind of the best of all worlds where you have every result clustered around your target. So the first focus I recommend generally is precision, which comes down to repeatability. So accuracy, so when I talk about accuracy, what do we say? Well, is it the real particle size? Well, that would be comparison to a referee technique. So if you use a microscope and you look at the particles, that's very well, well understood referee technique, it gives people an intuitive idea of what's going on. And so for larger particles, you can use a classical light microscope. You may need to use an electron microscope for smaller particles. One thing to watch out for is that you're measuring slightly different things with the two techniques and particles sometimes in different states. Uh, so if you look at a picture of a particle under a microscope, you notice there's lots of different ways to determine, define particle size. Uh, so you can, you're just gonna have to pick one and say it's in the neighborhood of what we see with laser diffraction. 
quick comment. There are two kinds of image analysis, dynamic image analysis with the particles flowing in front of the camera, and static image analysis, where particles sit on a slide and an automated stage. Here are pictures of the instruments, dynamic on the left, uh, where you have the uh, funnel and the particles are kind of falling in front of that white screen and my cameras are taking high-speed pictures. Or static, which looks very much like a classical microscope with some pretty powerful software and an automated stage for analyzing the particles size and shape. And we have some other webinars on image analysis if you're interested in that. So if you look at FDA guidelines, and they're pretty good guidelines for kind of all particle analysis uh, method development, which is why I bring them up. So for preclinical studies, you document particle size and morphology, maybe just using microscopy, and you can start initiating your methods for analysis. Now, really what it's saying is anytime you're developing a product where you think that particle analysis will be important, and certainly is in pharmaceuticals, then you'll want to start taking some notes very early on of what's going on, because that might guide you, well, certainly will guide you in the future for instrument selection or deciding if it's important to keep going. Moving on, well, for a phase one clinical study, you'll decide is a substance BCS class one or three. Basically, that comes down to is the drug poorly soluble, if it that's the class one or three, then you need to pay attention to particle analysis. The quick summary of this tree, uh, that, that's because a good, a very soluble substance, you don't really care what the particle size is because it can dissolve pretty quickly anyway. With smaller particle sizes, you get different dissolution for poorly soluble materials. And then you're gonna start to initiate development of distribution method. Then you would compare with an orthogonal technique such as quantitative microscopy. And so again, if you're making a process, you're starting with a new product, you say, is particle size important? Yes, it is. Now we need to start development of an analysis technique that's not gonna drive you nuts with random results. And you'll probably compare it with some other measurements to make sure everything makes sense. Okay, for phase three, again, coming from the FDA, do you have a final dosage form? Then you do wanna develop some size distribution method, compare with another technique, You'll want to validate this method to ensure that it's the method is robust. And then you'll decide whether you need that control uh, all the time in your manufacturer. Again, this is written really around pharmaceuticals, but it really applies to any particular product where if you're going to be running a factory, you want to make sure you have a robust method for analysis so you don't keep worrying as your results jump around. Okay, a little more into types of precision. Talk about repeatability. So. If I prepare a sample, and particularly if I have a liquid system that lets me recirculate, I might add it to my laser diffraction analyzer, recirculate, and hit measure multiple times. Hit measure, record the result, hit measure again, record the result, maybe wait a minute, hit measure again, okay? Now, you should have the same result uh, multiple times in a row, and that's very reassuring, it's a very important step, but it does provide limited information. It tells you about your analyzer performance, and tells you whether your suspension is going to be kind of happy in the instrument for a few minutes. Once you get through that repeatability, next question is reproducibility. You take yourself a bucket of material, you prepare your sample, you measure it, then you drain the system out, and you repeat everything from the beginning. So now you put in fresh liquid, fresh dispersant, take another lot of sample from your bucket, put it in, and make another measurement. And this is really what distinguishes a great method is if it's reproducible, if I can take a bucket of material and get the same answer time after time. Now, this is important because really what's happening is you're gonna be thinking about, is this slot the same as my next slot? So it's really a reproducibility question. And it also requires a lot more than just your analyzer. You also need to ensure you have good sampling, for example, and the rest of the method development discussion that's coming. So here's a great reproducibility result. We had 24 samplings of polystyrene latex. We emptied the instrument between each analysis and I just overlaid the frequency plots. Well, you can see just a little bit of blur on your screen from all these lines that are overlaid. You say, well, that looks great. And then you recognize there are a few things that help me out. You know, the first is that we had a liquid suspension with a narrow size distribution. So it's very easy to take random samplings from the bottle because most of the particles are about the same size, so there's not no segregation that's happening. It's already in suspension. I don't worry, have to worry about the suspension medium or how long it takes to ensure it's well dispersed. And of course, the analyzer is rock solid. 
So what does good reproducibility look like? Remember, prepare, measure, empty, and repeat. And if you look at ISO 13320, kind of the accepted standards, you're measuring three times and calculating the coefficient variation of D10, D50, and D90. And coefficient variation, as a reminder, is the standard deviation of the three measurements divided by the mean times 100, if you want to express it percent. So ISO 13320 wants a coefficient variation of less than 3% for the median size and a coefficient variation of less than 5% for D10 and D90. USP 429, which is really a kind of pharmaceutical approach, has a coefficient variation of 10% for D50 and better than 15% at D10 and D90. And then as a quick note, you double all the limits when D10, D50, and D90 are less than 10 microns. Basically, as the particles get smaller and you have dispersion questions, it becomes more challenging. And then you'll see that there are different targets for different audiences, if you will, the ISO versus the USP 429. And this is kind of a roundabout way of saying, hey, look at your own internal standards. If your uh, specifications plus minus 50% on the particle size, don't beat yourself up too badly about having great coefficient variation. But if you're trying to have a specification that's plus minus 1%, then a 3% coefficient variation is just going to be too much for you to work with. So think about what your end product goals are as you decide what reproducibility you need and what reproducibility you can achieve. The next question is resolution which is really kind of state is the ability to measure small differences in particle size. And there are two ways to look at this. Uh, small differences between successive samples. So if I have two production lots, is production lot A the same as production lot B, or is it changed enough to get me in trouble? And the second is, can I detect a small amount of material outside of, a main, outside of the main size distribution? Again, these kind of requirements go back to kind of your real world requirements. And I keep asking, or commenting on real world requirements, because as you have tighter and tighter testing requirements, your testing efforts get more and more expensive. And, and a lot of those efforts come down to things like careful sampling, careful preparation of dispersion, and so on. And this is these are people who are highly skilled. It's gonna start kind of really costing you a lot of distraction. So if you need this kind of precision, then you do the work to get it. And if you don't, kind of recognize that, declare victory, and move on to your next problem. So let's take an example of high resolution, which would be really how you would think about it in chromatography. If I have, say, 550 nanometer and 600 nanometer positron latex and some very old data with some frequency distributions, I see my peak at 550, I peak at 600, and those are measurements that are measured separately. So I can really tell the difference even with a very small change in particle size, or in this case, modal particle size. But very small changes in mean or median particle sizes, you can pick up with laser diffraction nicely. But if you mix those two together, I guarantee you, you're going to see a single peak. And in this case, you would not even see a shoulder. If I mix those two together, you would say, oh, I have a, a 575 nanometer PSL with a little bit of breadth to the distribution. So again, this goes back to what we mean by resolution. So if you want to differentiate between two buckets, you're in quite good shape at this kind of level. If you need to separate the particles and see each of the peaks, it's, it's not likely laser diffraction. But if my peaks are more widely separated, this is 80 nanometer, 204 nanometer, 500 nanometer polystyrene latex, then I can resolve multiple modes in single sample. So I see these three peaks and I can separate them out. And that looks great. Remember these peaks are about two to one ratio or a little bit more in particle size. And so that means that they're well separated. The previous example had a difference of about 1.1x. And so the wider separation lets me see distinct peaks in laser diffraction. That kind of rule of thumb holds. These are my glass beads, 100 micron, 200 micron, and 400 micron. And you can still resolve the three peaks. So it's really this, doesn't matter where you are on the size scale, it's the ratio of the peak sizes that gives you an estimate of how well you can separate things. Well, a more interesting, or I really should say useful game to play is identifying trace impurities. So let's say you are using colloidal silica and in a polishing process and median size of 30 nanometers, and that's in the upper left. And you're worried about one micron or two micron size particle impurities from the same material. 
Well, the game you can play is to add a little bit of the large particle impurities to your sample artificially, and then go make a measurement and see if you can pick them up. In this case, I made the measurement, and you can find that the tall red peak of the main particles is right there. And you see a little bitty peak, because only 0.05 weight percent that I added, of the 1.7 micron impurities, or the spike sample that I added. And so thinking about tests like this to see if your analyzer can pick up what you need to pick up or see how far you can get can be useful, particularly in later stages of method development when people say, well, how much can you find? Well, here's how you figure it out. Okay, for wet samples, I just realized it's not in order. But anyway, first you would choose a solvent. Do you want to measure the material in water, or with surfactant, hexane, or so on? So which liquid do you use? Then you'll find your particle refractive index, generally. You'll decide what kind of sample you want to use, which really mostly hinges on the volume of liquid you have, your pump and stirrer settings, your particle concentration, how long to measure. Do you need an ultrasound? And then if it does, you'll probably document your size versus time plots. You want to make sure you disperse the sample, you don't break the particles, and you check for reproducibility. Oh, there's a refractive index webinar. I put the link at the bottom of the slide. You need a real and imaginary refractive index for your particle, and this really tells the math what the light is doing inside of the particle. I generally recommend against pretending light doesn't go through the particle, or actually more exactly, I recommend you don't use a Fraunhofer where you just pretend there's no light in the particle and it's a two-dimensional particle. You can find particle refractive index values with literature web search. You can use a Becky line test or send it out for analysis. And then you can measure a sample and vary their imaginary components to see how the results change, recalculate and choose a value that minimizes the R parameter for error calculation. And kind of, we went through this a lot in a previous webinar, so I'm just gonna leave those comments there to remind you to go back and look at that. We do have a tool for doing this in the LA960 called the Method Expert. It actually does a lot of different things around the topics in this webinar, where basically I tell it the sample I work with, the range of refractive index values to try. I go let it calculate while I start setting my coffee, and it coughs up the graphs like you see here, where I have a distribution graph for each of the real and imaginary refractive index values I wanted to try. And then a plot of diameter as a function of refractive index and R parameter as a function of refractive index. And so now I can look at those plots, pick, say, the value in the R parameter, say, hey, you know what? I want an imaginary refractive index of 1i. Okay, sample handling. So the LA960 has a number of different ways to present the sample for analysis. And you can start with kind of the default system, which has a dispersing volume of 180 to 330 mil. You can move down the volume to mini flow, which is 35 to 50 mil, fraction cell 15. There's a small volume one, fraction cell at 10 ml. And this affects really the amount of dispersion that you need to analyze. I mentioned it later on, but the issue with fraction cells, you have particles that are over about 10 microns. They get a little large to be well stirred. Other than that, you pick these really around the volume material you like. And, and people tend towards the mini flow for organic liquids. It does have the onboard ultrasound and it uses a lot less organic liquid, which means not only do you spend less money on solvent, you spend less money on disposal. And you know, that's important. And the amount of material you require uh, kind of depends on the size. So this is something at 100 odd microns, I need 1.23 milligrams. A 35 nanometer material might need 100 milligrams. And nine micron, I need 0.16 milligrams. So how much material do you want? Generally in the milligram range and possibly hundreds of milligrams, particularly if you use a solvo flow. Okay, pumping and stirring. So the great thing about laser diffraction compared to dynamic light scattering is you're allowed to stir the sample. And that means that if you have any large heavy particles, you can bring them back up through the measurement zone. So you make sure they get analyzed. Or if you have anything that's large and lightweight that likes to float up, you can re-entrain them in a liquid so that you can ensure they're analyzed. So kind of you want to have a high enough agitation, which is mixing, and circulation so that the heavy particles and the, the large particles, whether they're heavy or light, stay entrained in the liquid. The upper limit is set really by how many bubbles you can tolerate being introduced. And 
One trick you can play, of course, is to increase the amount of liquid in your system so that the surface moves higher, which means you need more sample, but does suppress uh, the entrainment of air bubbles. And so these are kind of decisions you make and threes, which seem pretty low, but when we designed the system, they decided to, they wanted to measure things like ceramic balls and, and the like, they were very, very heavy and dense. So kind of going up to full agitation circulation is very vigorous in our system. But be systematic. This is something you want to keep kind of tabs on because this is a number you can go back and refer to this experiment and say, hey, this is what happened last time. This was what we predict will happen with a new product. The other is that this is where repeatability is important. So if you load the sample into the system and you start it pumping and stirring and you make your measurements and you see that your size is systematically going down or going up, it means that you have a agitation issue and you certainly want to address that before you move from repeatability on to reproducibility. So particle concentration, this is going to come next. And the thing about pumping and stirring is if you get the same answer on repeatability, you say, okay, I have those numbers kind of where I need them to be. The next one is how much sample or how little sample do I need? You want to have enough sample so you have a good signal to noise ratio. So if you look at the plot in the bottom, I have a chi-square on the left, which is a measure of signal to noise uh, as a function of transmission percent. So high transmission on the left means low particle concentration. And you can see that it's quite high uncertainty when I don't have very many particles, which kind of stands to reason. And then as I increase the amount of particles, my transmission goes down by moving right on the x-axis, and my noise goes down, I'm moving down the left axis, and my measure of particle size kind of settles down and becomes flat, and that's with the right axis for D50. And so you want to go low enough to avoid multiple scattering. So if I kept doing this measurement, I kept adding more and more and more sample, eventually you would see that flat spot kind of turn down or you see measured size change with particle concentration. Typically values you see are from about 80 to 95 percent transmission for particle concentration. It is sample dependent. It gets a little bit more exciting when you have strongly absorbing samples. So typically you'll measure at different T percents. You'll make a plot at D50 as a function of transmission percent to see what values give you a nice flat spot for concentration. Again, this is something that can be automated if you wish with our method expert. And finally, and possibly most easy is duration, which is really you want to measure long enough to get a good reproducible result. It's typically five seconds. It can go up to several minutes, but the vast majority of the time you measure for five or 10 seconds and you say, well, who cares if it's five seconds or 10 seconds, and then you're done. But if you do have a large, broad particle size distribution, you will want to measure for longer. Testing can be automated in software, and you can also use it for robustness testing, kind of test different durations, make sure you still get the same answers. Generally with modern systems, this is less of an issue than back when I first started this bit in particle analysis. All right, so I, I have a question that came in. If you have low accuracy or lower reproducibility, what can you blame or what might be the issue? Generally, if you have an issue with reproducibility, then you're gonna to have to go back and look at, I would start and go back and look at repeatability, which were those first tests of the pumping and stirring. And then I would move on, once I know I'm repeatable with the same sample in the analyzer, then I would move on to looking at things like ultrasound, which I'll talk about shortly, and then choice of dispersion. And then finally, although I, get, I suppose this comes first, is, is sampling or making sure you draw a representative sample from your container. Ultrasonic dispersion is adding energy to break up the agglomerates. You disperse the primary particles, ideally without breaking particles. It's kind of like changing air pressure on a dry powder feeder, if you're familiar with that. Most people set their ultrasound to 100%, turn it on for a few seconds, see what happens. Turn it on for a few more seconds, see what happens until you see that the size stops changing. Then you really look at the tails of the distribution. You look at the high end to see if agglomerates are being removed. If you start to see a whole bunch of new, smaller particles appear, it could be symptomatic of particle breakage. You want to test for reproducibility and think about really robustness. It's kind of hard to pick a great ultrasound level. And I'll comment on why in, I think in the next slide or two. I'm sorry, that might be in the air dry powder discussion, but we'll have comment on that later on. But you do want to focus on what power gives me the same answer over and over again for multiple samples. A couple of comments. 
don't use ultrasound on liquid liquid dispersions because you will start to break up the, uh, the soft oil droplets. Uh, you can find thermal mixing trouble with solvents, uh, particularly because you're putting a lot of energy into the system and if the solvent starts to heat up, you'll start to see kind of heat waves in, in the liquid. So if you've ever seen change of refractive index in air, like in the desert, it kind of looks like waves, similar effects, and that's gonna affect scattering. So you wanna wait for that to go away. If you're going for more than two to five minutes of ultrasound, I really recommend an external probe. We do have a customer that uses lots and lots of ultrasound and they tend to replace their probes very frequently. Works for them, but the external probe, if you need to put a lot of energy in, is a good idea. For more on sampling dispersion, there is a webinar listed at the bottom of this slide. Automation, we do have a method expert that systematically varies the level, the amount of time of ultrasound, your analysis iterations, your delay between ultrasounds and generate result graphs. So if you want to systematically walk through ultrasound levels, this is a tool for it. Okay, let's give some examples. Um, so this is ultrasound, and I was no idea. I probably, this is probably microcrystalline cellulose. And I start with no ultrasound in the red and about 80 microns. Oh, there it is, 74 microns. 5, 10, 15, 20. And I see my particle size, 66, 62, 59, 56, steadily decreasing with added time of ultrasound. I can plot my summary data. And I see that uh, my size starts at one second with fairly high sizes. My D9 is dropping rather quickly, and my D10 is dropping more slowly. But everything is slowly drifting down as I add more ultrasonic energy. So what's happening here is I'm doing two things. One, I'm kind of breaking up loose agglomerates, which I want to do. And two, I'm probably milling my particles and making my primary particles even smaller, which I don't want to do in an analog technique. So the next question is I pick kind of flat spots and I say, well, what's my reproducibility? So I do 15 seconds uh, and then I take another sample, do 15 seconds and so on. Well, this is Abacel, this is microcrystalline cellulose. I can measure D10, D15, D90, find the mean, the standard deviation, the coefficient of variation for each of those three parameters at 15 seconds of ultrasound. Quick reminder, some goals I have. So I want to beat 3% for D50 and uh, 5% for D10 and D90. Okay, and so this particular set of ultrasound does give me that repeatability. So I said, okay, I use 15 seconds to get the tight repeatability, and I haven't gotten too far down. I've got most of the way down this curve. All right, so here's a kind of an interesting study on reproducibility. These are actually 58 different methods for different materials uh, where they did some image analysis for morphology and then laser diffraction for size distribution. And they decided that whether or not the standard deviation was acceptable for QC. And you saw that with decreasing size, your standard deviation went up. And you see this kind of box up here, which is things that are not acceptable per USP 429. And, and this person who wrote it up, I cited it earlier, actually said, let's take out all the points that are not acceptable that I collected using, in the non acceptable region using a fraction cell. So I had all these points to the left, and then I removed the points that came when I used our smallest volume cell called the fraction cell, and only one remained. And so this is a pretty systematic analysis over a lot of samples. And this is where good record keeping really comes into the fore. So it turns out that fraction cell just wasn't a good tool for particles over 10 microns. With that, I can go back to look at my fraction cell and say, hey, you know what? I got this little tiny stir bar this magnetic stir bar that's keeping the samples in suspension, and it doesn't stir as well as the Mongo pump that's on the solvo flow system. And so what's really going on here, you had too many particles settling or floating to the top when they got large in a fraction cell you know, for regular analysis. And so this kind of record keeping and going back over history of samples, and in this case of materials, gives a very good hint about where you want to go in the future. So kind of one thing from this, one thing we like to communicate is, well, look, if you're over 10 microns, probably not going to be a great application for a fraction cell. And so you can kind of skip that step as you think about methods. Okay, so moving on to dry powders. So if you don't want to mess around with liquids and you start with a dry powder, then your workflow is very similar, but we're going to skip all the steps on liquids, obviously. 
first get your sampling right, because that tends to be a bigger issue with the larger particle sizes, they're dry powders, and determine refractive index, and that's done much the same way we did for liquid dispersions. And you'll measure several different pressures. And again, we're gonna find the optimum air pressure to have a good dispersion while not breaking particles. If you wanna get fancy and show off, you can compare dry versus wet measurements. If they're kind of close, you can really pat yourself on the back. You may also adjust other settings to, for sample concentration and duration. Uh, remember, when you make a measurement in a dry powder feeder, you have a vibrating tray, and so you have some sample segregation. So you wanna make sure that you measure all the powder placed on the sampler, and you wanna make sure you have kind of a constant mass flow rate for stable particle concentration during the measure. Once you set all the settings, again, you're gonna check reproducibility and optimize that. Here's a dispersion versus breakage rant I promised you. If you look on the left, I plot size as a function of increasing time. And theoretically, we have the size go down, a flat spot where it's stable, and then with more energy, you have your milling your particles and the average size keeps going down. In reality, the whole thing is much softer. Your particle size is drifting down, it may flatten out a little bit, and then may start decreasing again with increasing energy as it go to higher air pressure or longer ultrasound duration. This is just really an argument about energy rather than a particular kind of energy. The problem is that dispersion and milling can be a parallel rather than a sequential process. So in theory, I have aggregated uh, loose agglomerates or aggregated particles. I have the proper air pressure. They disperse. I increase the air pressure. I break the particles. Really what's happening, I have aggregated particles. I have a air pressure that disperses most of the particles and breaks a few. And then when my air pressure is too high, I break everything. And so you still want to be in that middle regime because it's the best you can do. But recognizing this happens helps guide you into why you're getting frustrated as you're trying to pick the right dispersion energies. So here's an example of a pressure titration. So purple is the lowest, dark brown is the highest. And you can sort of see a large peak at about 500 microns, and it's broken up pretty quickly at the medium and low powers, at the medium and high dispersion and pressures. And so this is typical what you see is you'll see them start to break up and you decide at what point I'm getting too many fines because I'm still breaking up some of these mid-sized particles into fines, even though I have some of the uh, largest left. So examples, magnetic stearate, high pressure in red, medium pressure in blue, uh, low pressure in black. So high pressure, of course, is the smallest. I can plot D90, D50, D10 as a function of the pressure setting, one, two, and three. And you can see how D90 is going down as I increase pressure. So I pick three conditions, measure reproducibility at three bar, D90 about 2.2% coefficient variation, at two bar, D90 at 0.9%, the one bar, D90 at 1%. And then I can summarize that. So I have pressure and then coefficient variation for D10, D50, and D90 in this table. Say, hey, look, at two bar, I have the tightest repeatability. And so that's the one I go for. Now to get results like that, remember that sampling is important. This is going back to a case of learn to love your riffler. Uh, so you have to have a representative sample before you even get going with this kind of analysis or else your sampling issues will dominate your, your reproducibility. So kind of a summary, you have to have a representative sample. For powders, dry powders, you select your air pressure. For wet suspensions, you'll suggest your wetting material, your dispersing uh, agents. You may decide to add energy. You'll tend to check accuracy with microscope or dynamic light scattering. Unless your particles are perfectly spherical, I would not expect the same answer from laser diffraction and from any other technique. That's because of the biases of each technique and really how we define particle size in each technique. But if someone measures a rectangular particle microscope and gives you the same number that you got in laser diffraction, something's a little funny. Uh, it, it does happen with perfect spheres. Otherwise, investigate your system settings, concentration, agitation, ultrasound, design for maximum precision. Reproducibility is really the name of the game. And follow the guidelines and the standards. If, if you're doing as well as ISO 13320, unless there's a good, strong reason to put the extra effort in, it really is time to declare victory. Okay, I think that is all. So I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you and open the floor or I guess open the chat box for questions.
Well, thank you, Jeff, for the excellent webinar. In case if you have questions, feel free and don't hesitate to reach out to us at labinfo at hariba.com. Um, so one question that came in from our audience is, how to empirically develop test method accuracy? What are the key factory inputs for this analysis? So if you want accuracy, all right, I guess I'll work backwards. The first thing I like is reproducibility. Before I talk about accuracy, I want to make sure I get the same answer twice because I can always take a, a erroneous answer and multiply 1.2 or whatever to get to the right answer. As long as I have the same one every time as my sample change, or I should say, as long as it follows sample changes properly. Working backwards from reproducibility, I need good repeatability. So the first thing is put some sample in the analyzer, probably 80 percent, 85 percent, 90, and then measure three to six times. Just hit measure, wait, measure, wait, and see if you get the same number. And if you don't, then you're gonna start looking at your uh, agitation and circulation and see seeing if, if that improves things. You may look at your ultrasound. If the sample is breaking up slowly, you may wanna accelerate that with ultrasound just so you can answer in a civilized amount of time. Once that's nailed down, then you start clean the system out, get your T percent somewhere reasonable, add a little sample measure, add a little more measure, and so on. Then go back and say, oh, I got a good T percent, I have good repeatability, I use my riffler, and now I'm going to measure the same sample. I should say measure a sample, clean out, measure again, and so on, and look and see if your reproducibility is there. If you're using external ultrasound, you may find that even the liquid level in the cup has an effect. So you'll start looking for things that are varying in order to decide what, what you need to fix. Thank you. Second question, how important of each of the following particle analysis? So particle size versus particle counts versus particle type. It depends on what you're trying to do. Okay, so if particle size is important for all sorts of processes where you either know how many particles you have or you don't care. So for example, you have a truckload of filler that's coming in for your plastic, right? Say you have a truckload of TiO2, you're making paint, you want to check the particle size of TiO2. Well, you know how much you have, you have a truckload. So you don't care about concentration and you'll have some sort of chemical analysis for particle type, or you may. Particle count comes up, particularly when the number of particles is important. And that comes, say, if you're measuring exhaust or soot coming out of a factory or a car, and Hariba has some products that do that. Uh, if you're measuring the number of, of aggregate impurities, say if you're making a protein drug or you're, if you're measuring the number of virus particles. So that's where particle count dominates. And then particle type, I guess the application springs to mind right now because it's hot as microplastics in the environment. So if you go take a sample of the ocean and you find all these particles and some of them are natural particles, they're bacteria or clumps of bacteria or little bits of dead plants and some of them are little tiny bits of plastic. And then you'll have to start using some sort of spectroscopy to decide which particles are important to you. So it really depends on what you're doing with the information and where the particles come from, which dominates. That was a really good answer. I just had a peek. Um, the person who posted this question is doing water, um, some sort of application on water. Um, so that applies. Um, okay, okay, the oh, next. Oh, the other one for water is number of bacteria. So mm. I, I know people that count bacteria in water. So, okay. They can reach out to me offline if they want more comments. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the next question is how necessary is how necessary is using the standard between measurements? It kind of depends. So let's say you're measuring the same thing all the time and it's very easy to clean the analyzer. Then you may not measure a standard, you know, more than more than once every few few weeks or something like that. Or if you're using unknown materials and they tend to be a real mess to clean up, you may use a standard just to ensure the analyzer is, is cleaned, that there's no leftover particles from the last user. So that's kind of a risk-based decision about how often you do it. And it's going to come down to how is the analyzer used and what are the issues if you have, a, if you have an issue. Now, one way you can get around the cost of standards is, of course, is to measure a known material in your own lab. You know, if, you're, if you manufacture something, just set aside one bucket of it to use as your, as your check standard. But the analyzer, te it tends not to be analyzer issues. It tends to be user issues that you identify first by checking with standards. And they're important to check for. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Hope that helps. Okay. And I 
think that's all the questions we have as of now. Do you have anything else that you would like to add, Jeff? No, I, everybody saw the the address, email address if you have follow-on questions. And if, if you're interested in water quality, particularly microplastics, contact me offline and I'll put you in touch with the ramen folks who know a fair amount about that. Perfect. Um, we can look at particle type two. For now, have a great day and we'll see you at one or more of our future webinars. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Bye, all. Bye.